welcome back to another episode of Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. What comes to mind when you think of our solar system? You probably picture its biggest member first, the Sun, circled by our own Earth and other planets from Mercury out to Neptune. Maybe you pause and wonder about Pluto, or add our Moon, or try to remember how many moons Jupiter is up to by now. What you might think of are the many smaller members of our solar system. Things like asteroids, comets and other little rocky and icy objects are everywhere. They're an important part of our solar system and studying them can help us learn a lot about the history of our own sun as well as how the planets and moons and other objects formed. Taking a census of our solar system's smallest members and studying motion and composition of asteroids and comets can teach us a great deal about the part of the universe that's right in our backyard. We also have a pretty practical reason for wanting to keep an eye on these objects like this, one that I am sure the dinosaurs would understand. Near-Earth objects or objects with orbits around the Sun that bring them particularly close to our planet are the focus of a great deal of research. At close proximity, near-Earth objects are a fascinating chance to study other members of our solar system in great detail, and we know from our own planet's geological history that at very close proximity collisions with these objects can give us everything from pretty meteor showers to cataclysmic events that can change life on Earth. To begin with, let's sort out some terminology. What are asteroids, meteoroids and comets and what do these distinctions mean for how we study them? Asteroids are rocky objects orbiting our Sun. Their size can vary greatly from 1 metre across to nearly 600 miles across and they are typically composed of carbon, silicon and nickel iron composites. We think that asteroids formed in the same way as Earth and understanding this can take us back to the early days of the Sun's life, before there was a solar system to speak of. While our Sun was still a young star, it would have had something called a protoplanetary disk, a thick ring of gas and dust and other cosmic debris left over from the cloud that formed the Sun itself. Inside that disk, tiny cosmic dust grains constantly collide, and in some cases the dust grains will stick together, a phenomenon you are probably familiar with if you've ever looked under your couch. As these building blocks grow progressively bigger, they eventually have enough self-gravity to be held together, becoming small rocky bodies known as planetesimals. During the formation of our solar system, some planetesimals continue to coalesce, eventually becoming the planets that we see today. Others lasted a while but eventually collided with larger objects or get nudged into very wide orbits around our Sun. A few planetesimals were captured as moons, like Mars's Phobos and Deimos. The rest remain in the solar system today as asteroids. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter contains 1 to 2 million asteroids that are larger than a kilometre, and many more millions smaller than that. Other asteroids trail behind planets or follow their own unique orbits around the Sun. Comets have a similar history to asteroids, with one key difference. We think that asteroids formed in the inner part of the Sun's protoplanetary disk, in the warmer region closest to our central star. Comets, by contrast, seem to have formed further out in the solar system, which gave them a crucial extra building block, ice. The comets we see today began as planetesimals, amalgams of rock, dust and ice and frozen molecules, travelling in wide and highly eccentric orbits around our Sun. This means that comets take on a distinctive appearance when they approach the Sun. Comets can get close enough to begin to see their surfaces fried by the flux of photons coming from the Sun, their surface warm and begin to release gas and dust, giving comets their distinctive tails. Most comets actually have two tails. One comes from the dust particles streaming off the comet as it approaches the Sun. It's easy to imagine this dust trailing behind the comet as it streaks through the solar system, blown back by the comet's motion, 
but in fact the direction of the tail is dictated by the position of the sun. The dust will always move away from the sun and winds up appearing as a curved white tail, reflecting the sun's light and leaving a trail that indicates where the comet used to be in its orbit. The other tail comes from the gas pouring off the comet. This tail appears bright blue thanks to its glowing gas particles and is swept in a straight line away from the sun by the strength of the solar wind, a stream of plasma and charged particles speeding away from the sun's upper atmosphere. You might recognise these two tails from photographs of especially bright comets in recent years, like the comet Neowise that passed close to Earth in July of 2020. In astrophotography they look spectacular, but to naked eye observers the two tails tend to give comets a faint, fuzzy, sometimes slightly asymmetric appearance. This appearance was a key factor in early discoveries and identifications of comets. Caroline Herschel recognised many of the comets that she discovered thanks in part to their diffuse appearance. A contemporary of Caroline Herschel, Charles Messier, was a dedicated comet hunter who famously began maintaining a list of not comets pesky objects in the sky whose wispy appearances resembled comets and kept distracting him in his searches. Ironically, that catalogue of more than a hundred items later became Messier's most profound contribution to astronomy. The Messier objects included many of the brightest supernova remnants, nebula and nearby galaxies in the sky. Even today, many of the objects are best known by their Messier number. The Andromeda Galaxy, for instance, is often referred to as M31. Discovering new comics and asteroids can be a challenging proposition. Remember, unlike stars, these objects don't glow. Any light they emit comes from reflected sunlight or latent heat, making them incredibly dim objects. Spotting them requires deep and detailed observations, and confirming that a tiny point of light is in fact a member of our solar system comes from studying its motion. If you watch the night sky from beginning to end, you'll notice the slow and steady motion of the stars. Rising and setting together at perfectly predictable times, maintaining the same spacing and patterns that we recognise as constellations. Astronomers refer to this as sidereal motion, the apparent motion of the stars that happens thanks to the rotation of the Earth. However, this works because the stars are extremely far away. From our perspective they act like stationary points on the inside of a giant turning dome. The planets and other members of our solar system do something a bit different. Their position in the night sky depends on the rotation of our Earth and on their orbital motion. As a result, from our perspective, the planets trace unique paths through the night sky, with positions that change considerably relative to the background stars. This is non-sidereal motion, and it can lead to some surprising phenomena. For example, Planets usually appear to move from west to east in the sky from night to night, slowly drifting further east relative to the distant background stars that make up the constellations. However, since each planet orbits the Sun at its own speed, those of us observing the sky from Earth sometimes find ourselves overtaking more distant planets in their orbits, or being overtaken by the inner planets. This speed mismatch results in a scenario where planets sometimes appear to move backwards relative to the stars, from east to west. This is called retrograde motion. Astrology fans might recognise the term, but retrograde motion doesn't mean that anything bad is going to happen. It's just a quirk of how fast different planets orbit the Sun relative to the motion of our own Earth and the backdrop of much more distant stars. Most of the objects in our solar system, the Earth and the other planets, and even many asteroids and comets, orbit around the Sun in a fairly flat plane. 
Our Earth's axis is tilted at more than 23.5 degrees relative to that plane. This means that from our perspective the Sun and other planets follow a set arc-like path through the sky that we refer to as the ecliptic. Many of our solar system's asteroids and comets also lie along the ecliptic and all of them move in a way that looks a bit peculiar relative to the stars. This means that if an astronomer is able to spot one of these small faint objects and keeps an eye on it for long enough to watch it move through the sky, they can identify it as a small solar system member and begin to make guesses about what it is, how far it is and how big it is, and even where it might be headed. Asteroids and comets are fascinating scientific targets. Their masses, orbits, chemistry and populations can tell us a great deal about the origins of our own solar system. We still have many questions about how stars like our Sun form debris disks, planetesimals and planets, and our solar system's history holds the key to understanding where we come from and how planetary systems around other stars might work. We'll talk about more distant planets in the future, but for now we can take a closer look at the science of studying asteroids and comets. It's easy to think of astronomy as an exceptionally distant science, and it's true that even a trip to our nearest neighbour in the solar system, our own moon, takes several days. Still, for very close objects in the solar system, astronomy can move beyond studying light and gravitational waves. We can ask geological questions, send probes to look at them close up, and gather samples we can study in the lab. And sometimes samples even come to us. This type of research is known as planetary science. Planetary science grew in part out of geology research here on Earth, and a puzzle that faced geologists in the middle of the 20th century. It was a puzzle caused by an asteroid, or rather what used to be an asteroid. About 35 miles east of Flagstaff, Arizona is an enormous crater. Three quarters of a mile across and 560 feet deep, its presence has fascinated geologists for decades. In 1960, most geologists believed that it had been caused by a volcanic explosion. However, a few remained unconvinced and were fans of an earlier and less popular theory. They thought the crater had been caused by some kind of impact from space. The impact theory was still around, albeit unpopular, when a young geologist named Jean Schumacher began to study the crater. Jean Schumacher was born in Los Angeles. His family moved between big cities and rural towns following his father's work. As a child in Buffalo, New York, Gene developed a love of science, but he began looking down rather than up, collecting rocks and minerals. He was a precocious student and at the age of 16 he began college at Caltech. Four years later he had completed a master's degree in geology and began working for the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. At first, Schumacher's work had nothing to do with astronomy. He studied uranium deposits and the geology of volcanic vents. His research led him to northern Arizona and eventually the immense crater near Flagstaff. The crater fascinated him so much that he made it the subject of his doctoral thesis at Princeton. Schumacher recognised that the crater bore a strong resemblance to craters formed during atomic bomb testing. When Schumacher and his colleagues began studying the chemistry of the crater, they recognised minerals that could only have been formed in high temperatures and pressures of a tremendous impact. They reported that the crater had not been formed by a volcano. It had been formed by a meteor. Remember, asteroids are rocky members of our solar system, and their size can vary from just a metre to hundreds of miles. Today we think the object that formed Gene Schumacher's crater in Arizona was more than 150 feet across when it struck the Earth. It was probably much larger when it was travelling through our solar system as an asteroid. However, 
When it entered Earth's atmosphere, it probably shed mass, burning off in our atmosphere as a meteor. You've seen meteors whenever you catch a meteor shower. You might be familiar with the Perseids, which happen every August, or the Leonids, which happen every November. But most of the objects that create these streaks in the sky are relatively small. The meteor that formed Arizona's crater would have been much bigger, producing a brilliant multicoloured streak as it incinerated in the atmosphere, culminating in a cataclysmic impact and leaving behind the rocky remnants we know today as meteorite finds. The crater in Arizona is now famously known as Meteor Crater. Gene Schumacher's research marks the beginning of his work in a fledgling field, planetary geology, which later became a crucial branch of planetary science. Schumacher went on to work closely with the Apollo program, creating a geological map of the moon and helping to train astronauts who gathered moon rocks and did groundbreaking geology research that helped astronomers better understand the origins of the moon itself. Schumacher had dreamed of being the first scientist to visit the moon. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed with Addison's disease in 1963, an illness that disqualified him from the astronaut corpse. However, he continued to campaign vigorously for the inclusion of a geologist among NASA's lunar astronauts, and succeeded when fellow Caltech-trained geologist Harrison Jack Schmidt visited and explored on the moon as a crew member of Apollo 17. Planetary science has experienced an immense evolution in the years since the Apollo program. We haven't yet sent crewed missions to any other objects in the solar system, but we have capitalised on humanity's spaceflight abilities to send missions all over the solar system, including many that have specifically focused on studying asteroids and comets. The Galileo mission to Jupiter was the first to perform a close flyby of two asteroids in the early 90s. The Stardust mission, launched in 1999, was a landmark achievement for planetary science. It flew close enough to a comet to actually collect samples of the dust grains pouring off the comet's surface, before successfully returning to Earth, bringing the samples home for planetary geologists to study. Similarly, the Hayabusa mission landed on an asteroid in 2005 and collected samples that were returned to Earth. More recently, the Rosetta mission flew to a comet and in 2014 successfully dropped a lander onto its surface, debatable, marking the first ever landing on the surface of a comet. All of these missions were made possible by the enormous teams of people working with NASA, the European Space Agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and others. The engineering, design, fabrication, launch and operation of these kinds of missions is an immensely complicated process and one that can only be achieved with the dedication and hard work of hundreds of astronomical heroes. For astronomers who often study stars and galaxies that are millions or billions of light years away, the idea of visiting the objects we study seems like the stuff of imagination. The fact that this is possible for moons, other planets, asteroids and comets is a testament to the incredible scientific and technological advances that we've made in the field of planetary science. Still. Sometimes planetary scientists don't have to go to quite so much effort. Sometimes, as in the case of the object that made Meteor Crater in Arizona, the objects come to us. In the years after the Apollo project, Gene Schumacher turned his attention to searching for asteroids and comets that might impact Earth. His work involved identifying these small faint members of our solar system and then mapping their orbits. With enough observation, he and his colleagues could project the paths of asteroids and comets and keep a particular eye out for ones that could cross Earth's path. One of Gene's colleagues in his work was his wife Carolyn Schumacher. Carolyn was not a scientist by training. She studied political science and English literature and spent the first part of her life as a stay-at-home mother.
raising her and Jean's three children. In 1980, with the children out of the house, Carolyn began a second profession as an astronomer at the age of 51. She worked as Jean's field assistant, studying impact craters and researching for Earth-crossing objects. She personally discovered more than 800 asteroids and 32 comets. In December of 1993, the Schumachers, working with an amateur astronomer, David Levy, discovered an unusual comet. It had once been travelling happily through the solar system, but a close pass near Jupiter had torn the comet into fragments and dragged it into an orbit around the giant planet. Using the same technique that they applied to search for near-Earth asteroids, the Schumachers and Levy projected the comet's path forward and eventually realised that the comet was on a collision course, not with Earth, but with Jupiter. The comet, dubbed Schumacher-Levy 9, slammed into Jupiter in July of 1994. Prior to the impact, astronomers hadn't been certain of what they would see but observations from the Hubble Space Telescope quickly revealed the dramatic evidence of the collision. Schumacher-Levy 9 left a string of dark bruises along Jupiter's southern flank that were visible for months afterwards. It was the most dramatic collision ever observed by modern astronomers. Tragically, Gene Schumacher passed away just a few years later in a car crash while on an impact crater expedition in Australia. Carolyn, who was injured in the crash, later resumed her planetary science work. She continued to emphasise the importance of understanding the composition and physics of asteroids and comets, both for learning more about our solar system and for understanding the fate of our own planet. This gets at one of the key questions when studying near-Earth objects. Let's say astronomers do discover an asteroid or comet on a collision course with Earth. What exactly can we do about it? We might not need to do much. As we've seen from Meteor Crater and the flurries of meteor showers that strike Earth's atmosphere every year, Earth is hit all the time. But impacts are small. They might simply burn up in the atmosphere or leave behind a small meteorite. Occasionally we do see larger visitors. You might remember a blinding meteorite that exploded over Chelyabinsk in Russia in 2013, producing a huge shockwave that damaged buildings and caused injuries. Most are a source of spectacle rather than serious concern. However, we do know that some impacts can be considerably more catastrophic. Geologists have identified two enormous impact craters that formed within the past 100 million years, and both are associated with extinction-level devastation on the surface of the planet. One, a 62-mile-wide crater in Siberia, can be traced back to a sizable extinction that happened 35 million years ago at the end of the Eocene era. The fossil record from that time period shows evidence of a huge number of mammals going extinct and including some families of primates. The other, a 93 mile wide crater off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, was formed 65 million years ago and famously led to the end of the dinosaurs. The meteorite that produced that crater could have been from 7 to 50 miles wide when it hit. Researchers believe that the impact itself would have had the power of a billion atomic bombs. In the aftermath, ejecta from the impact tumbling back to Earth would have ignited massive fires across the planet and hurled soot and other matter into the atmosphere to create something akin to a nuclear winter, with a terrible cascading effect on everything from the large dinosaurs to the small plants. So. What would it mean if we spotted a huge near-Earth object on a collision course with Earth? It would certainly have the makings of a global emergency. Scientists today study the possibilities of breaking apart asteroids and comets like this, or diverting them in their orbits by enough to steer them clear of our planet. Efforts to find and study these asteroids are also underway. As Caroline Schumacher pointed out, Understanding these objects and what they're made of is important, 
And in the case of a huge meteorite heading towards Earth, a crucial first step for understanding what might be able to be done to avoid extinction. Asteroids and comets, these small members of our solar system can teach us a great deal about our own origins and may hold crucial information about our future here on Earth. We've seen fossil record evidence of how impacts affect our own planet. And Schumacher Levy 9 showed today's scientists the devastation that can be unleashed when an asteroid or comet strikes any one of the eight planets in our solar system. Yes, eight planets. Next week we'll continue to study some of the small and rocky members of our solar system including another class of objects circling our sun and the key they hold to understanding what happened to our former ninth planet, Pluto. Well, that time seemed to go fast. Anyway, as always, everybody please stay safe and look after one another, and I'll see you again next week. Bye for now.